Now we're going to look at the marketing mix. In other words, product, price, place and promotion, which are also known as the four P's. We'll end this section by looking at elasticity. Once a business has analysed its market and decided on a strategy, it then needs to apply the right combination of product, price, place and promotion. If any of these four areas aren't correctly applied, it might be difficult for the firm to achieve its objectives. Right, let's start with product. Before products reach us, they'll have been in development for a long time. A business can't take the chance that a product may fail, and therefore the new product development process is important. This process identifies new product ideas, chooses those with potential and tests markets. If successful, the product will then go into full-scale production. Market research plays an important role in finding out what customers want. The more accurate the research, the more likely the business is to develop a successful product with the right design, features and benefits. Let's move on to price. Price can be divided up into the following areas. New product pricing strategies, existing product pricing strategies, pricing methods and pricing tactics. We'll start with new product pricing strategies. There are two main strategies, skimming or penetration. Skimming is charging a high price when the product is launched. If sales are good, this will enable the firm to cover its initial costs before a new competitor arrives. This strategy is often used for high-tech products, which have incurred high research and development costs. This is also useful for innovative products, or products with a USP. Remember, this was a unique selling point, as customers may be more willing to pay a higher price if they can't buy similar products. For example, iPod when it was first launched. As competitors enter the market, the firm will tend to lower its prices. Compare the price of PlayStation 2 now to when it was first launched. Penetration pricing is where a low initial price is set so the business can gain a foothold in the market and try and gain market share. Now, this strategy is more useful for products which aren't really innovative and are sold in markets with lots of substitutes. As there are so many alternatives, a high price would put off new customers. Back to Elliot. Thanks, Will. Now, let's look at existing product pricing strategies. First, price leader strategy. This is where a firm sets market prices, which are then followed by other competitors. Next, price taker strategy. Here, a firm follows prices set by the leader. And finally, predator strategy. Just as the name suggests, a firm undercuts the competitors to force them out of the market. These strategies depend on the dominance of the firm, their objectives and their resources. A price leader is most likely to be the firm with the highest market share and brand loyalty. If they cut prices, competitors will try to follow suit and be a price taker. Although this might not always be possible, as their unit costs may be higher as they won't be spread over as many units. A predator strategy can be used to force weaker competitors out of the market. Dominant firms with low unit costs can afford to cut their prices for a while, just long enough to force out smaller competitors who have higher costs. Price also looks at the setting of a specific price rather than a strategy. Here we have cost plus pricing, contribution pricing and discrimination pricing. To refresh your memory, cost plus is a simple method where an amount of profit is added on to the unit cost. Therefore, at price X, the seller knows that profit will be made. For example, if a toaster costs £3 to make, the manufacturer would add on another £3 which he knows will be profit for each toaster sold. 
Contribution pricing involves setting a price which ensures variable costs are covered and goes towards covering fixed costs. As soon as enough units are sold, fixed costs will be covered completely and then profit can be made. Discrimination pricing involves setting different prices for the same product or service at different times. Let's consider a couple of examples. Think about train fares. You can pay peak and off-peak prices, or telephone calls where it may be cheaper to make calls in the evening. The greater the demand, the higher the price, as people will be willing to pay more. For example, people commuting to work by train will have to pay the prices set by the rail operators. At times of lower demand, prices will be lower to try and attract more customers. Finally for price, we'll look at tactics. We'll look at loss leaders and psychological pricing. Loss leaders are products with very low prices that attract customers. The hope is that customers will make additional purchases. This is often used by supermarkets to get us into the store. It's then very difficult for us just to buy one item and the supermarket can make more sales. Psychological pricing works by making us feel that we are paying the right price or making a saving. For example, marketers know that customers feel that they are getting a better quality product if the price is higher. Therefore, setting a higher price for certain products can actually attract customers. A new gym, for example, may charge higher prices if it wants to attract more affluent customers and the members will feel that they are joining a more prestigious club. Image-based products like clothing and services can use this tactic successfully. The second aspect of psychological pricing is very common. When you see a price of £3.99 rather than £4, it's psychological pricing because £3.99 does seem much cheaper than £4 even though it's only one pence difference. Right, let's look at the third part of the marketing mix, promotion. Promotion can either be above the line or below the line. We'll look at this first and then go through some additional points and some exam questions. Let's look at what's covered by promotion. See how above the line and below the line can be further broken down. Above the line is really mainstream advertising that we see all the time. Apart from the examples on the diagram, there are also billboards, bus stop advertising, plus loads of others. See if you can think of some. When we talked about segmentation earlier, we looked at dividing customers into groups with common tastes. This makes it easier for the marketer to target promotion to these people. For example, if I wanted to target a new pair of trainers to men aged 18 to 25 and wanted to use advertising, I would probably use TV and put adverts on in the evening when my target market had got home from college or work. It would be pointless to put ads on earlier than about 6pm as my target market wouldn't be around to see them. I could also opt for magazine advertising and use magazines like Loaded and Nuts as my target market are most likely to see my ads in these magazines and therefore my sales are more likely to increase. It's important in the exam to think about who the target market is before recommending advertising methods. There's no point, for example, in suggesting TV advertising for a firm that sells its products to other businesses. But you could suggest advertising in trade magazines. So that was above the line promotion. The other form of promotion is below the line. See on the diagram how this includes sales promotion, personal selling and direct marketing. And I've given some examples. Let's start off with sales promotion. This is a really common method of promotion and is used to increase sales in the short term. It doesn't aim to build an image like advertising can do, but it will catch our attention 
and hopefully get us to buy the product over the period of time that the promotion is running. For example, cereals often ask you to collect tokens to claim a free gift, so you end up buying that cereal for a while. The hope is that you then carry on buying that cereal even after the promotion has ended. New products often have a sales promotion, so we'll swap from our current product and try the new one for the first time. The hope is that we'll like it so much that we won't swap back to our old product. Another form of below-the-line promotion is direct marketing. This works by trying to promote the product or service only to those people that are likely to buy it. If you think about advertising, a lot of the adverts are seen by people who aren't going to buy that product. For example, is a 70-year-old woman likely to buy a pair of Nike trainers if she sees them on TV one evening? Direct marketing uses a technique called direct mail to form a direct link to potential customers. For this to work, businesses need to have contact details of their likely customers. For example, pregnant women may sign up for a baby catalogue and their details will get passed on to similar businesses who can then send out information to these women. Maybe companies like Heinz or Pampers will send out information about baby foods or nappies. The point is that these women are much more likely to buy these products and the promotions can be much more effective. This technique can also be used by firms wanting to promote themselves to other businesses. Finally, let's talk about personal selling. This is commonly used when one business wants to promote its goods to another business. For example, if a knife manufacturer was trying to promote a new set of professional chef knives to restaurants, it's more likely that they would have a salesperson visit the restaurant to promote and demonstrate the product. So, in the exam, remember that there are different types of promotion that can be used, and advertising is not the only form of promotion. You need to consider the business in your case study and ask these questions. What type of product are they promoting? Is it to consumers like me or you? Or is it to other businesses? You also need to think about how much they can afford to spend. A limited budget may mean TV advertising is unrealistic. Maybe local newspaper advertising would be more affordable. Also, think about the target market. So what forms of promotion are most likely to reach them? It's important that you can show the examiner that you've really understood the business in the case study. OK, let's go over to Jess to talk more about promotional techniques. Now let's look at the final P of place. This refers to the distribution of a product or the location of a service. It's important that customers can get hold of the product or service without too much difficulty, otherwise they may just buy a competitor's product instead. Location can prove to be difficult for new businesses. For example, a new shop would want to be in a prime location so there are lots of passers-by. The problem is that this location will be expensive and unrealistic for a business with lots of other costs to cover. So, a cheaper location is often used, but this means fewer passers-by and therefore lower sales potential. Another good example for location is theme parks or any other tourist attraction. A good question to ask would be, can tourists get there easily? A place like Alton Towers is in a fairly central location, whereas Creeley's in Somerset may be too far for people to travel who live further north in the UK. It's important to think about what place means to the business in your case study. Don't talk about distribution channels if it's a service, as this won't make sense. OK, so what are distribution channels? They're ways in which products move from the manufacturer to the end consumer. Let's have a look at what choices a business has. Products can go directly from the manufacturer to the customer, or from the manufacturer to the retailer, 
are even from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer to the customer. You might hear wholesalers and retailers being referred to as intermediaries. A firm's choice of channel depends on different factors. For example, the ability of the manufacturer to carry out distribution. Some firms may not have the ability to move their products and this is where an intermediary can help. The intermediaries may also market the products and this can save the manufacturer costs. The type of product also affects distribution choices. More exclusive products will have a limited distribution. For example, haagen opted for limited distribution to increase the product's appeal and Rolex watches can only be bought in particular outlets. A final consideration is distribution targets. Some firms have an objective of increasing distribution through certain outlets. If this is the case, intermediaries offering wider distribution networks may be used. Generally, the more intermediaries, the higher the final price to customers will be, as each intermediary will mark up the price so they can make a profit. Direct distribution from manufacturer to consumer is becoming increasingly popular due to internet shopping with savings on distribution being passed on to customers via lower prices. We've now looked at the four parts of the marketing mix and as you've seen it's a big topic. Questions in the exam may focus on one of the four P's, for example price, or it may just focus on one aspect of one of the four P's, for example skimming pricing, so it's important that you understand the content material well. If the question asks you about skimming, don't talk about penetration pricing unless it's really relevant. Don't discuss other pricing strategies or methods and remember that you don't have long in the exam so just focus on the set question. Don't be tempted if you see the term marketing mix in a question to write everything you know about the four P's. This is because the examiner is really looking for you to show knowledge of the topic that is applied to in the case study. Demonstrate you can analyse your ideas and evaluate if asked to. If we consider a general marketing mix question, this may become clearer. Have a look at this question. To what extent can using the marketing mix ensure success for Planet Organic? Let's say that Planet Organic are a new chain of organic supermarkets. They have four outlets in London and are now looking to expand across the UK. They have a large marketing budget. Now pause and have a go at answering the question, but only spend about 10 minutes on your answer. OK, how did that go? I would have started with a definition. Then I would have pointed out that organic food is becoming more popular. It's quite expensive and targets higher income customers. I would somewhere in my answer want to point out that people are prepared to pay higher prices if they think the product is high quality. Planet Organic may see higher sales because of this, as people think there's a real difference between non-organic and organic foods. For location, I'd ensure that my answer examined the importance of being near more affluent customers so that they could maximise sales. For promotion, I'd explain that by promoting in the right places, more people would see their ads and therefore sales may increase. To balance my answer, I'd say that using the marketing mix can't guarantee success because it can't help with what the competition may do in the future or how economic factors may change. I might include the example of higher interest rates, meaning lower disposable income. Therefore, people may cut back on spending a lot of money on organic foods and switch back to non-organic foods. What I'm trying to do is think about the organic food market, the type of people who buy the products and the wider issues such as competition. By thinking about these things, I should be applying my knowledge to the case study. My analysis will come through looking at the four P's and saying how exactly they could lead to success. For example, having the ability to charge higher prices may mean costs are covered more quickly and profit can be made. 
The evaluation will come through recognising that using the marketing mix doesn't necessarily lead to success, but that other factors are important as well. Right, that's the end of the marketing mix section. That leaves us with elasticity. We'll go through price elasticity of demand and income elasticity of demand. Price elasticity measures how sensitive demand is to a change in price, whereas income elasticity measures how sensitive demand is to a change in income. We'll start with an explanation of the topics and then do some calculations. So, price elasticity of demand first of all. Businesses want to know to what extent changing price will lead to a change in demand. For example, can a firm reduce prices and expect to see an increase in sales? Demand can either be price elastic or price inelastic. So, understanding price elasticity can enable a firm to make the right pricing choices. Although it's often felt that inelastic demand is better, it does mean that firms don't then have the advantage of being able to really increase sales via price cuts. What makes a product price elastic or inelastic? Well, if a product has many substitutes, for example chocolate bars, it's likely to be elastic because customers can simply swap to another product if the price goes up. So, products with few substitutes tend to be inelastic. Products can also be elastic if they have a USP, because no other products will offer the same benefits. So, even if prices go up, the customers are likely to still buy the product because they can't swap to another. When iPods first came out, their USPs were their size, power and design. People were prepared to pay the high prices because no other products offered the same benefits. This made them less sensitive to price changes. Heavily branded products also have demand that's less sensitive to price changes because people feel the brands are worth paying for, meaning they will more readily accept price increases. These are useful ideas to remember in any of your answers that discuss changing product prices. Now let's have a go at some calculations. Here's the formula you need to work out price elasticity of demand. As you can see, it's the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Most students remember this formula but forget how to calculate percentage change so let's look at that formula too. Here it is. It's the change value divided by the original value multiplied by 100. If I give you some figures, you can have a go at the calculations. Make sure you show all your workings out, because in the exam you may get marks for understanding the formulas, even if you get the answer wrong. First, work out the percentage change figures, and then do the elasticity calculation. Here are the figures you're going to use. Price is reduced from £100 to £94 per unit and sales rise from 4,000 to 4,480 units. OK. Had a go? Your workings out for the percentage changes should look like this. First of all, for price 6, which is the difference between £94 and £100, divided by 100, which is the original value or figure multiplied by 100. This gives a percentage change of 6. For demand, the change value is 480 because it's the difference between 4000 and 4480, divided by the original value of 4000 multiplied by 100, 
which gives an answer of 12%. This now gives us the figures for the elasticity calculation. So, it's the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Our percentage change in quantity demanded was 12, so that goes on top. And our percentage change in price was 6, so that goes underneath. 12 divided by 6 is 2, which is our answer. Remember, a figure of one or more is elastic, so our answer of 2 means that demand for the product is price elastic, and the percentage change in demand is greater than the percentage change in price. This means the firm could use price changes to stimulate sales, but may be more vulnerable to competitors lowering their prices. So, doing these calculations can be useful for a firm, but you've got to remember that the calculations are only as useful as the data used in them. If the data is old, then the results may be less useful. Also, changing prices in light of the calculations doesn't take into account what your competitors are doing the state of economy, changes in technology or changes in consumer tastes. Income elasticity works in the same way, only this time it looks at how changes in income rather than price affect demand. Here's the formula you need. It's the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in income. Like for price elasticity, some products will be income elastic and others will be income inelastic. Basic necessities, like some foods, such as bread and milk, are likely to be income inelastic, meaning demand for them doesn't change to the same extent if income changes, because we need these products. But although the product category might be income inelastic, certain brands within the category might be elastic. For example, people with higher disposable incomes may opt for more expensive brands of bread, like Tesco's Finest or Sainsbury's Taste the Difference. But if their incomes fall, they may swap to Tesco's or Sainsbury's basic bread. Luxury products tend to be affected by income, and businesses that work in these markets need to try and find some way to overcome this. For example, through clever promotion, so the customers feel they have to have the products. Why don't you have a go at working out an income elasticity? Here's the information to work from. Average income has fallen from £25,000 per year to £20,000 per year. Let's Travel have seen the number of holidays booked per year change from 400 to 200. Calculate the income elasticity of demand. Show all your workings and analyse your answer. Had a go? It should look like this. First of all, the percentage change figures. The percentage change in income is £5,000 because it's the difference between the £25,000 and the £20,000. This goes over the original value, which is the £25,000, and we multiply it by 100, giving us a percentage change of 20%. The percentage change in demand is 200, which is the difference between 400 and 200 holidays. This goes on top here, and underneath is the original value of 400. This is then multiplied by 100 and gives a figure of 50%. You can then use these two figures to do the income elasticity calculation, which is the percentage change in quantity demanded, which is 50, divided by the percentage change in income, which is 20. This gives us an answer of 2.5. This answer is greater than 1, and so is elastic. Holidays are a luxury, and demand for them is sensitive to changes in income, and change in income will lead to a greater proportional change in demand. OK, so we've had a look at the calculations. Now let's have a look at an exam question. Here's the question. Try and spend about 10 minutes on it. Discuss the value of price elasticity of demand to a heavily branded sports shoe manufacturer. Had a go? Let's have a look at some of the points you probably included. You probably started with a definition to get some early content marks. You might have then gone on to say that branded products tend to be price inelastic and so customers may accept price increases because they're buying an image. 
This means the manufacturer could increase revenue and profit. You may have said in your answer that some sports shoes have USPs, which also leads to price inelasticity. So, the firm could charge higher prices, but USPs are quickly copied and firms need to be careful of this, as customers may swap brands. To show evaluation, you probably pointed out that elasticity doesn't take into account the competitors, and because it's a fashion market, the competitors could soon bring out a newer and better product. These points are related to the sports shoe market, for example by saying it's competitive, image-based and fashion-led. These ideas focus on how a firm can benefit from using elasticity and may gain you analysis marks. Looking at the limitations of the technique will get you evaluation marks. Remember, the more exam questions you practice, the better you will become.